The whole overarching sermon series that we have been on has been one book, one story. And the idea is, is that the New Testament, and as Christians, we believe that the point of the Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does the entirety of the Bible uphold that, specifically the Old Testament? And we've been looking and taking a step-by-step -step journey through the Old Testament. And as we have last week looked at the covenant of Abraham, the New Testament makes a very bold statement that the covenant of Abraham is fulfilled in none other than Jesus Christ. That not only would there be great blessings that would come through the line of Abraham, but a king. And we learn later in Genesis through Judah and then later in 2 Samuel through David. But then as well we learn that the offspring, the seed, the promise, the one who's going to crush the serpent's head, the one that's going to deal with sin, is going to come through Isaac. And we ask the question, if the New Testament lays claim that the full fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant is in fact Jesus Christ, does the Old Testament believe that? And so we went to the book of Isaiah. And the book of Isaiah clearly speaks of the Messiah who's going to come from the root of Jesse and the line of David. who's going to be a blessing to all people, not just the Jews is going to be the one that's going to deal with sin once and for all. And triumphantly and beautifully, we see that the Old Testament itself testifies that Jesus Christ is none other than the fulfillment, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, if you add to Jesus Christ as Messiah and he being the answer to the Abrahamic covenant, as Christians, we make the bold claim that the way in which we gain access to that is by grace. That we can't earn the right place with God. But in fact, God gives it to us, that God accomplishes that work. And so for Christians, we talk a lot about grace. And so if the covenant, the new covenant of Jesus Christ, which is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, is centered on grace, is ratified by grace, is instituted in grace, is that true for the Abrahamic covenant? Because again, we make this bold claim. You see the Abrahamic co covenant? That's Jesus. But again, I ask the question, we as Christians say the way that we gain access to Jesus is through the grace of God. By faith. Is that what Abraham's covenant was guaranteed in? And so last week we looked at chapter 12, in chapter 17, but I also told you chapter 15 contains the covenant as well. And that's the chapter we're going to look at today. Genesis chapter 15. Last week we looked at the covenant itself. Today we're looking at the, 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 how the covenant was fulfilled, how the covenant was brought about, how was it ratified. And, 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 and Genesis 15 is going to give us that. Let's take a look. We're going to read Genesis 15 together. We're going to read the chapter. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar, Eleazar of Damascus? And Abraham and Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans, to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abraham, but Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all of these, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into, the, into a deep sleep. 
as a thick and dreadful darkness came over him, then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and, and, and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and will be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its, its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, to the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the, Gir the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are an amazing God. And as we seek your face in Genesis, we see none other, than, none other than the face of Jesus. Make him clear today. In his precious name we pray. Amen. So we're talking about the concept of grace. We're talking about the concept of grace. Now, what is grace? And, and we throw that word around a lot. And I always try to give a quick definition just so we're all clear. A wage is something a worker earns for the work they put in. That's a wage. A prize, a trophy, a reward goes to the winner, the champion, to the victor. But grace is a gift given to the undeserving. It's just given, whether the person merits it or not. Grace is just given to those who don't deserve it. And so when we come to the story of Abraham's covenant, we say it points to Jesus, but is it fulfilled in grace? And so let's take a look at chapter 15. As we see this story unfold, we see again God restating the Abrahamic covenant. And in a dream, he, he states to Abraham again that he's going to be his great reward and these blessings are going to come. And Abraham, not in a lack of faith, but just in, in, in a basic inquiry. Lord, I mean, I don't have an heir. You're talking about all these, you know, the, you know, the great nation, all these things. My, my heir is, is my servant. And so then God tells him very clearly that his heir would come from his own body. And not only that, it would be, take, took him outside, look at the stars. If you can even count them, so it will be like your people. More than it can be counted. And then God then not only speaks of this great nation, but again talks about the land that will be given to them. Now what's interesting in this moment is God's laying out a covenant, a contract, an agreement. And what's interesting there in verse 7, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 8, Abram says, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? What guarantee do I have, God, that this is going to happen? How do I know you're going to bring this about? Now, in our culture, if there's a contract, if there's a, 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 an agreement made, we use a piece of paper, don't we? And how do we guarantee it? We sign it, right? That's how we ratify, that's how we guarantee a contract, an agreement. In fact, generally in our culture, the lesser person is the one that has to sign. So let's say I go to, I don't know, I go to a phone company and I want to get a cell phone plan. Okay, the president of the cell phone company doesn't show up and sign the contract with me. I, the lesser, I'm not the corporation, I'm not the company. I'm the one that signs. And in that contract, it'll say all the bad stuff that will happen to me if I don't live up to my side of the deal. In fact, that's what happens when you get a mortgage for a home, right? How many of you, this is probably maybe more true recently, but I think it's probably always been somewhat true. There comes this moment when all the mortgage work is done with the bank, and you sit down with your real estate agent. They love this moment because that's the day they get paid. Okay, the check shows up that day. And there is, that's right, Ed. There, and there sits around you in a, in, a, in, a, in a room full of lawyers, 
a contract that thick, and you sign, and you sign, and you sign, and on every each one of those pieces of paper tells you what awful things are going to happen to you if you don't pay your mortgage. If you fail to live up to your side of the bargain. And so in our culture, we sign on the dotted line. In Abram's culture, it really is somewhat similar. But instead of signing on a piece of paper, they wouldn't sign a contract. They wouldn't sign a covenant. They would cut a covenant. And so when God speaks to Abram and says, Lord, how can I get a guarantee of this? God tells him to go get a bunch of animals. Abram would have known exactly what that meant. And in fact, we see Abram cut the animals in half. A heifer, a goat, a ram, and then he sacrifices a dove and a young pigeon. And the picture is that these animals would be cut in a path and placed across from one another, like a path would be created. And the blood would run down between those animals. And so a path of blood would be created between animals cut in half. And what happened in their culture was if you're going to make a contract or agreement, just like in our culture, the lesser one is the one that has to sign on the dotted line. The lesser one is the one that says, I take on the penalties and the curses. And so what happens, so say a king was going to make an agreement with a lesser governor or a lesser king or a vassal. The king, who has all the power, he's not going to pay the price. But if the vassal doesn't live up to his agreement, may what happened to these animals happen to me. That's the symbol. And so the lesser would usually be the one that would pass through the animals. Just like in our, and there's rare occasions in our culture where both sign. But for the most part in our culture, it's very much like theirs. The lesser is the one that says, I'll take the curses, I'll take the penalty. I'll be the one that suffers if this deal isn't left up to, isn't kept up to. And in Abram's culture, the expectation at this moment for Abram would have been, God instructs him to get those animals. He does what is required to cut a contract. And then you, Abram would have expected, God would have said, okay, now Abram, walk through it. But it doesn't happen. In fact, you're almost given this sense that a lot of time goes on because the, the, the birds of prey, it didn't it happen outside. By the way, those watching online, I explained to these people, while I was preaching this in uh, outside our outdoor service, literally while I was preaching this part of the sermon, a hawk landed one foot from me outside, and I had to drive it away. And so, a little, a little spooky. But... Abram had to do that, and as time went on, you would imagine Abram thought, I'm going to have to be the one that walks through it, but that word never comes. In fact, what happens is, what happens to Abraham? He falls asleep, but not an ordinary sleep, a sleep in darkness. So what's the picture here? Abraham's laying there in darkness. He's not the one that's going to walk through the contract. He's not the one who's going to ratify it. He's not the one who's going to walk through the blood. But who's going to walk through the blood? Who's going to take on the curses? Who's going to accept the responsibility for the broken covenant? God shows up and in the, in the image of a torch passes through fire, passes through the blood. And the picture here is ripe and powerful. God is saying in this moment, I will take the part of the lesser. While Abraham lays over there in, 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 in the sleep almost of death, Alive, but yet appearing dead. God walks through the blood. God says, when this covenant, and it already was broken, by the way. Wasn't the covenant between man and God already broken? It was broken back in, in Eden. Has man ever been able to live up to anything? The covenant was already broken. And so when God has those animals split, split and that blood and God walks through that blood by the, by, by, the, by the picture of his fire by that torch in, in the smoking pot as he walk, as, that, as that passes through the blood the picture is that God is saying I will ratify this covenant the sign by which I will seal this covenant is that I will take the penalty on myself I will become the lesser and I will walk through the blood I will do that while you lay in the death of sin, while you lay in the sleep of death. I will walk through the blood. I will take the penalty for the broken covenant. I will do what's necessary because Abraham, you cannot. Now, brothers and sisters, does this need any commentary? 
while we were while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians five twenty one. For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son. For it is by grace you have been saved. You see, Abraham's covenant points to the greater covenant of Jesus Christ. And it was ratified by grace, by what God did. And we can read in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus willingly took the place of the servant. He willingly took the place of the lesser. Even though he was God. And while he took on the place of the lesser, he took sin upon himself. He took the curse upon himself. He laid himself down. He ratified the covenant by walking through the blood. His blood. Does the covenant of Abraham point to grace? Emphatically. This covenant would be ratified by God taking on the punishment. By God walking through the blood. While man lay in the sleep unable to save himself. But now how does Abraham receive that gift? How does that gift become real in his life? What becomes the core of that? For the Christian, we would say, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son grace. Now how does man receive that? For whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For it is by grace you have been saved. How? Through faith. Correct? Where does faith find its part? If the covenant of Abraham points to the covenant of Jesus Christ, where is faith? Well, let's take a look. As you look at the beginning of Abraham, excuse me, Abraham, Genesis chapter 15, we see God state the covenant. <clears throat> And Abraham asks some basic questions. How is this going to happen? And God tells him, you know, go out and count the stars. And, you know, it's going to, the offspring is going to be from your own body. And then verse 6, what does it say? What does it say? Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed the Lord. Now, what does that word believe? In the Hebrew, the word believe or faith means to lean on, to put your weight on something. All right, I'm putting my weight on this guy, right? I'm putting my weight on this podium. Why? Because I have some kind of work belief that despite my size, this will hold me. Right? I felt a little more safe with the big pulpit. But, but anyway, <laughs> right? I'm putting my weight on it. Now, honest, honestly, I'm not putting my full weight on it. Why? Because I don't trust that that one little tiny one's going to So I have partial faith. Right? I, I partially am putting my weight on it. For Abraham, he put his full weight, he put his full trust and I think, honestly, one of the best ways in the English language to understand the word faith is, is to use a synonym, trust. He trusted in it. And as we look at the life of Abraham, we see that trust at the heart of, what, what, of, of who he's called to be and who he is. And then it says that it was credited to him as, as righteousness. So when God looked at the account, when God looked at the life of Abraham, and was going to decide, is this man right with me? That's what the word righteous means. Is this man right with me? Is this man and I, are we rightly related? Is he right with me? Has he done what's required? In fact, in the Old Testament always, it's, it's about, you know, have you, have I, you know am, I, am I right? Am I, have I done what was required? Have I satisfied what's necessary? Has Abraham satisfied what is necessary based on his behavior? Now, you have probably know some of the stories that surround the life of Abraham. Some of them are kind of awkward. One of the weirder uh, moments that happens twice in the life of Abraham is that apparently Sarah is, is a very attractive woman. Okay, kind of bugs bunny like when people see her, they just fall in love. And she's not a spring chicken either, so I mean, my goodness, she must have been quite a lady. And so when they go in different places. One of them in Egypt. They see her. And what does Abram say? My sister, what a weenie. 
right? I mean, he allowed his wife to be left vulnerable. Instead of him putting his neck on the line, he makes her be the one who's put on the line. Makes the kings who are now living under a falsehood put their integrity on the line. Does not handle that well. And not just once, but twice. In fact, Isaac falls under that same trap too. But then, as well, the whole Isaac and, and the whole Ishmael and that whole family drama, I, Abraham's not exactly leading well through that one, is he? He's not a perfect man. But when God looks at the account of Abraham, he's counted before God as what? As right with God. Why? Because of his faith. Because he trusted. Because he leaned in. When God said it, when God made the promise, when God made the covenant, he put his weight on it. He said, this is what I'll trust. This is what I'll believe. This is where I'll place my hope. And we can see this lived out in, in the life of Abraham. We go back to chapter 12. How does, this whole, how does this whole dealio start? It begins with the Lord saying to Abraham, leave your country. But verse, chapter 12, verse 1. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to land I will show you. Now imagine how much faith that would take. We're leaving, honey. Where? I don't know. God's going to show us. Before that man could put one foot in front of another, it took immense faith. Now go back to chapter 15. God says you're going to have, a, a, you know, you're, from your heir, from your line, is going to come from your body, is going to come a great nation. Now, let's face it. How old is Abraham when Isaac's born? 100 years old. He would be, Al Roker would celebrate him as 100 years young. Right? They'd ask, and people they, on the newspaper, they'd ask them dumb questions like, how do you get to be 100 years old? Like they know. You know? How'd you get to be 100 years old? I didn't die. That's how I became 100 years <laughs> <laughs> How old was Sarah? Maybe more importantly, right? 90 when I was 90. 90. He trusted. When God said it, God laid out his covenant and promise, he believed it. Think about that moment in Genesis 22. To me, one of the most powerful and heart-wrenching, but most, most amazing passages of the Bible, when God asked Abraham to lay down his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Turn with me there real quick. Just, let's just look at it real quick. I mean, while we're talking, now, let's just look at it. Genesis 22. Before Abraham ever picks up the knife to accomplish what God has asked him to do, he says this in verse 5. He said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. We will come back to you. Then there's that moment where Isaac's kind of going, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Hey, Dad, what's going on here? Imagine that moment. And what does Abraham say? God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Before he ever took the knife in his hand, he believed. You talk about putting your full weight on God. Oh, my goodness, this man was counted as righteous. Not by a pure and perfect life, but by his faith in Almighty God. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Why is that? Why does God arrange it that way? Because this book is not about an amazing group of people who figure it out. And God just kind of goes, wow, these people are awesome. I can't hold them back. Look at them. They're amazing. This book is about amazing God. We live to bring glory to God. When we get to heaven, will they clap for us? No, we will cheer for Jesus. Because it will be by His grace we are saved. Through faith in this, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one will boast. And on that day, we will not boast before the Lord. We will cheer Jesus Christ. And for all eternity, we will sing His praises. Amen. In fact, Romans chapter 4 would say to us, speaking of Abraham, therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace. So it can be by God's gift. We receive by believing 
by just simply trusting in the promise. Then you come back and you say, the pastor, this is the Old Testament, right? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, you know, Ten Commandments, kosher kitchen, laws and festivals. Law, statue, command, circumcision, the law of Moses. And so you're going to tell me that as I walk through the Old Testament, that it's really about grace through faith. Let's take a look. We're in Genesis chapter 15, but I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. God in chapter 17 restates the covenant again. And as God restates the covenant again, great nation, king's going to come from you. It's, it's wonderful. It's amazing. You know, a land all your own. It's going to be, it's going to be fantastic. In verse 9, God continues on. He says, Then the Lord said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep, every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the covenant between you and me. It will be a sign of the covenant. Now let me ask you a question. Which came first? The chapter where Abraham, Abraham has faith or the, or the chapter where Abraham obeys the law? In which chapter was, was, was Abraham counted righteous by his faith? 15. When does the beginning of the law start? Chapter 17. In fact, you have a homework assignment. And I want you to do this. I plagiarized this sermon today. And I want you to read the original source. Next week, I'm going to come in and ask you if you've read Romans chapter 4. Please, for yourselves, I want you to yourselves read. Next week, I'm going to come in and go, did you read Romans chapter 4? Please put your hands up. Right now, I'm actually looking at you to see how many of you actually write it down. Or put, maybe put, a, put, a, put, an, put an alarm on your phone. Like tonight, it goes off at like 7 o'clock. Like, why is my phone going off? It's, oh, wait, I'm supposed to read Romans chapter 4. I text myself, weirdly enough, I have an account called me, and I text myself things. Let's read Romans chapter, I know that's strange. It actually comes through twice, that's what's interesting. So I send to myself, and then it actually dings back to me, it's fantastic. <laughs> Leave yourself a message, do what it's, please do that though. I want you to be in the word. I want you to hear from scripture, I want you to hear the sermon of Paul who speaks in Romans, everything I just taught to you today. Because brothers and sisters, faith comes before circumcision. Faith comes before the law. And for us, why was Abraham asked to circumcise not only himself, but his family and his offspring? As a sign of the covenant. It was not a replacement of the covenant. It was not a fulfillment of the covenant. It was what? A sign of the covenant. And when we obey God, it's not a replacement of the covenant. It's, a, it, it's not a ratification of the covenant. He did that by his grace, by walking through the blood. We receive that by faith. But the reason we obey is because we are a part of the covenant. Because we want to show that that covenant is real in my life. I obey. I follow what God has commanded. I live my life to be like Jesus. Why? So that I can gain access to the covenant? No, because I belong to the covenant. And the reason why Abraham and his offspring were circumcised was not so they could gain access to the covenant. is because they already had the covenant. And it's by faith. And Romans chapter 4 will tell you. It's by faith that we gain access to the promise. And it was by faith that the people of Israel, it was their hearts that were circumcised more than their bodies. But yes, obedience is important because as a sign that the faith is real. How do I know Abraham's faith is real? James would like this. Book of James would like this part. Of it. How would I know that Abraham's faith is real? In fact, James chapter 2 references Abraham. How do I know that what that man believed was true? He lived it. He lived it. He had the kind of faith that would show up in his real life. It wasn't just the kind of head knowledge. 
He leaned on it enough that he actually was able to make it real in his life. When God said go, it's like, well, I believe that. He's going to show me. He's going to take me to a land. He's going to give that to me. And how do we know he believed that? We had faith, but we know that faith was real. Why? Because he lived in it. Because he did it. Because, because God said it, he believed it, and, it, and the sign that he believed it, the evidence that the faith was real, was that the man went. How do we know that he trusted God, that his faith, we're going to come back from the sacrifice. Servants, we're going to come back. Son, God's going to provide the lamb. How do we know he believed it? He took the knife in his hands. Now, that, that action is not a replacement for faith, but it's a clear evidence of it. And the kind of faith that Abraham had and the kind of faith we're called to live in is the kind of faith that isn't just, well, I think a fact and I know that to be true. But the kind of faith that actually has the courage to live out what we say we believe. Abraham had faith. That's what made him right before God. But as a result of being right before God, as a result of being belonging to God, as a result of the covenant being in his life, then he obeyed. Pastor Jeremy and I talk a lot about obedience. We talk a lot about being set apart. Why? Because we all want you all to get to heaven? No, because you claim you are going to heaven. And so you need to live differently. Because you belong to Jesus Christ. It's not the circumcision that made Abraham receive the covenant. It was his faith. But as a result of being a part of that covenant, now he was to be a set apart people. Grace, faith, then obedience. For it is by grace you have been saved. Grace through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The order is clear. No one is saved. No one's going to stand before God by saying, why well, I, I did this and I did that. Brothers and sisters, this world will know whether or not the fruits of repentance are real in your life by what you do. Now, those things are not going to save you, but they are the sign that something real is going on in your life. How do we know Abraham was the real deal? Because we can see his faith by what he did. Now, again, what he did was not a replacement for his faith. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But it was evidence of his faith. Is that what the gospel teaches? Is that what the gospel preaches? Amen, absolutely. And is that found in the Old Testament? Amen. Absolutely. It's the clear message of the scriptures from beginning to end that the promise is given to us by faith. And that faith comes first. Then, then comes the opportunity to obey. And that obeying is important. Um, the analogy I like to use is, is my sons. I have three sons. They have access at my table. They are my sons. They didn't earn that. They don't merit that. Not that they don't not merit it, but they've not done anything to be my sons. They are welcome at my table because they belong to me. And they don't lose their place at that table on the basis of what they do, but because they're my children. I sometimes use the phrase, Andy Griffith uses, you know, go be somebody. You know, sometimes I'll say that, be somebody. Like, because they are my sons, I expect them to be like me, and I expect them to obey me, because they belong to me. And the reason you're asked to obey, those who love Jesus obey his commands. Who are those that obey, who are those that love Jesus? They're the ones that obey his commands. If we have a relationship with God, from that relationship then flows the obedience. And that's the very gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't trample on a weak grace. We live seeking to demonstrate the new covenant of Jesus Christ in our life by what we do. So our light can shine before them. And they give glory to our Father as salt and light in this world. I'll close with a story from Billy Graham. This is an oldie but a goodie, and this has been used a thousand times, and it's, it's you know, in, in any good sermon illustration book, it's a well-worn uh, sermon illustration. And it goes something like this. Billy Graham is in a small town, and he gets a part, he gets a traffic violation, speeding ticket, parking ticket. He has to go before the magistrate, he has to go before the, the local justice. 
And as he goes before the local justice, the local justice realizes it's Billy Graham. And being quite impressed and in awe and wanting to, to, to show his appreciation for Billy Graham, he's in a tough situation, right? And he loves this man. He sees this man, admires him. But the judge says, you know what? A, a, a crime has been committed, an offense has happened, and the penalty has to be paid. And so here's the fine, and he strikes the gavel. Then the judge stands up and gets out his wallet, and he says, but I'll pay the penalty for you. That's what Jesus Christ has done for us. In the Abrahamic covenant, we see a God who would be willing to walk through the blood and take on the penalty for us. And by simply by faith, we receive that gift. And today, if we don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not by association. There are actually many mainline denominations today that are actually teaching and, and, and telling people that I have this wayward son, I have this wayward daughter who walked away from the church, and they're an atheist now. And there are now pastors saying, oh, it's okay, because when you baptize that, that kid as a child, your faith will save them. That's a lie. Mainline, many mainline denominations are starting to teach that because they have a crisis in their church. What do we do with all these wayward people? Well, the faith of the parents is what will save them. The Bible in no way teaches that. Each and every person has to make a decision to trust in Jesus Christ. And it's by that faith we're made right. When your credit is read before God and that book of life is open, your righteousness, you will be counted right with God only by your faith in Jesus Christ, not by your works. But my hope for your life is that people will know that you love Jesus and you belong to him by your works. This is the precious hope of the gospel, and I pray that you live in it. Now, my last little challenge. Your future is secure, church. The grace has already been given through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, with this election, will you believe? That's your challenge this week. Do you have faith in God? Your future is already secure, by the way. It's already been purchased through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, those of you who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will you live by faith? And what will that look like this week? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord. This is a powerful image. We ask the question, is grace real in the Old Testament? And is faith real in the Old Testament? This book that speaks of law. Absolutely, Lord. And we see faith. The promise comes. Then faith. And then we see the obedience. But we thank you for that. We thank you for that clear pattern. I, I just pray, Lord, that, that, that as you continue to unpack for us the clear demonstration of your gospel and scripture, that not only would souls be saved, but Lord, you would so cement and help us understand that gospel that we ourselves would be able to share and, 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 and to express that amazing gospel which is able to save. But Lord, I also pray that your people will, will have a cultivated hunger to be in the word themselves, to read these things for themselves, the great hope of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. God bless you. Let's stand together as we close and sing.